right so before we start do you have any questions A question from Hitendra is, get or create did not work. Uh, it should work, it should work. All right. Okay. So which one did you try? This, you, you tried this one. And also please notice that when you are trying this, you have to use this this version of Spark, all right? Did you use this version or you use the normal Spark shell? I see, I see. Yesterday there was some confusion between 2.2.1. So I'm going to stick to this one in order to, uh, right? So there would be minor differences. It should be possible to tweak it. All right, so it should work. So give it a try and let me know if there is a problem. Also, while you're doing get or create here, here, you can skip this part. Okay. Or even if you leave it as such, it's completely okay. All right, now. A question from Sachin is, can you please explain the difference between DStream and RDD? So we had discussed it yesterday at this point. So RDD is essentially one record. It could be a string, it could be an object. The whole record could be like this. While, so RDD is made up of records while data frame is made up of columns and rows. Okay. So that's the main difference. So this is for structured data processing while RDD is for unstructured data processing. A question from David, which would be a faster to process? So if you have your data in the form of tables already, data frame would work just fine but since data frame has a metadata overhead therefore the usual rdd works uh, perfectly fine but as per the claims from spark sql that the data frame does not impose any overhead so data frame is uh, really fast too all right Theoretical perspective, yes, RDD would be faster because there's no overhead, overhead of um, overhead of uh, columns. So theoretically, RDD should be faster. But in reality, what they have done is they have done a lot of optimizations at this point. So there are only slight slight bit of overhead. Now, question is, what are the disadvantages of what are the disadvantages or advantages of data frame, right? So data frame, for creating data frame and fully utilizing it, we need columns to be defined. But if we are processing raw data, but if we are processing raw data, then the RDD makes sense, okay? But if you are processing data that has columns, then data frame would make more sense. If let's say you have some day, table, uh, you have some records in which first record is integer, second record is a string, third record could be a complex object and so on, then RDD would make more sense as compared to the data frame. All right, if the data is, All right, 
So, so that's the important part. Now there are a few more questions. A uh, question is from Bintao. Question is um, uh, console error value implicit is not a member of uh, org Apache Spark and this. Now you could you could give it a try by. Uh, are you sure you are running this command? Okay, are you sure you are running this one? Let me also run it with you. Okay, let me give it a try probably. Okay, so this is my export. This is another variable. Okay, and let's just try this one. All right. Yes, David, I will answer the question. All right, now moving ahead here and let's try this out. So when I do this, it's working. And when I do last one, let's see if last one makes sense here. Okay, so it seems to work for me. Oh, sorry. You have to convert this into a single line, right? And how do you convert this into a single line? By bringing it like this. Okay, because it's a single line. All right. So you can see that we have now another Spark object. This is another Spark object. We could have actually done something like, something like Spark one or Spark. Uh, you can say my Spark, so that that variable called Spark would not, would not impact. All right. So give it a shot, or you want me to write the entire code? I'll do that. So the command part is command part is here. Command part is here where we are. We are first exporting this. And um, all right, I'll just close this probably or just save uh, another. Um, what is the date today? Today is 6th May. And 6th May PDHS. All right, so I'm going to just give you, so this is the command part where which you will run on the bash. Okay, and this is the, this is still the command part. Okay, and uh, on this part, this is, this you should run on bash. Okay, and this is on scale up round or spark cell prompt. All right, that looks like this one. So this is what you should run there. Okay, uh, let me just give you the complete command so that you don't make mistakes. That's okay, you can ignore that. It's just a warning. All right. This is required. The second part, this part is re this part is required only if you are creating our application. Here we are basically creating our Spark object. All right, 
So this is the to be run on the shell. This is to be run on the prompt. Okay. I'll just put it like this. Great. So this way you can execute. Yeah. All right. Great. So let's get started. And I've exited the shell and created again because I had overridden my Spark object. All right. There was a question from David and there was a question from Robin. Those questions let me answer. A question from Robin is, can we generate a data frame data frame out of uh, RDD? Yes, a very good question. Yes, we can create a data frame out of an RDD, right? Now, all right, uh, look, I have given you the permission to record. A question is, okay, Hiten, I think you'll be able to solve that problem now. So even if you have column data, why use data frame? Good question. So a question from David, David is that even if your data is in the form of columns, right? What's the point of using data frame when you already have RDD using which you can do maps, flat map and reduce and reduce by key and so on. You can almost do everything with RDD. Then why to use data frame? Very good question. To answer that, I will walk through many more examples and you will get an idea. In general, it gives you the ability to do processing without having to write code. You can use R-like syntax, whereby you can do projections, slicing and dicing of the data, and column selection, row selection, really quickly. Similarly, you could also do you could also do SQL on the same data frame, so that you don't have to write complex queries. You don't have to write a complex code. You can just write SQL. Okay, so it makes it easy, really easy, to process data in the form of tables. Okay, so if you have structured data, then you use data frame. You can create data frame from all sorts of sources, as well as you can convert an RDD into data frame and vice versa. All right, so that's pretty much. Okay, now question from, question from Bintao is, Mintao is, does Spark only deal with RDD and data frame from RDD? So data frame can be created from RDD and from all kinds of sources. That's what I want to demonstrate to you. All right, question from Robin is, what are the tools, what are the tools and processes used to generate data frame from RDD? I'm going to talk about those very soon. Question from Raju is, can you please repeat again? So repeat which part again, Raju? Just to add, it is easier to filter and analyze data when you have columns. That's correct, Robin. So, okay. So yes, so you can convert an RDD into data frame. And when you have data frame, it's very easier to filter and analyze when you have columns. So you can say where this column is greater than this and this column is greater than this or this column does not have this. So it becomes really easy to process the data frame containing columns. All right. All right, let me just exit from here and minimize this. Okay, so can I enter into full screen? A question from Raju is that, what about the structured data as RDD? Do you need, still need the data frame? Correct. In case of RDD, if you have structured data, it doesn't may, mean anything because RDD does not have a separate column definitions. You can inject the objects into it, any kind of object into RDD. The record can be any object, right? And then you can apply map, map, flat map, filter, and all the functions that we've studied, okay? So, but but still, you, ha you still have to write code. <clears throat> but in case of data frame, you have all the functionality plus 
you can also operate on the underlying record using the RDD functionality. So RDD provides you the, the columns and everything. Along with that, it lets you access the underlying RDD to do various kinds of filtering, okay? So Bintas' question is, does Spark SQL only deal with data frames? Yes, yeah, so data frame is one of the constructs of Spark SQL. It's a core construct and idea around which the whole package is structured. All right, so but Spark SQL deals with the, the data frame. Along with that, Spark SQL deals with the situations where we are loading the data frame from Hive or we are we are say doing the entire the entire package has uh, though the data structure is um, data frame but the underlying mechanics is provided by the entire package all right so let's get started so so let's take a look at this file this file is this this file is uh, a file in the hdfs so we can open another 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 Okay, so a question from, uh, I've opened another terminal so that I can access the uh, console, increase the size of the window. Okay, now here, let's take a look at people.json. All right, the people.json is, uh, you, you can see here, So people.json is not a valid JSON file, okay? Why? Because it's not a single JSON object. The people.json contains lines where each line is a valid JSON. Now, once you have this kind of, um, once you have this kind of uh, object, once you have this kind of object, then then you can convert it into, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, so once you have this kind of object, then you can load it using read JSON method of Hadoop, no, sorry, of Spark. Okay, let's, let me just show you. So you can just say spark.readjson. Oh, what happened here? All right. So here, here we have loaded the data frame. It takes a while to load. It's not as lazy as we think. And it's a bit, it is going to basically probe the JSON file by sampling it and then figuring out the columns out of it. Okay, so it has automatically figured out the, the column names. I hope my voice is coming through fine. Let me just check. Okay, so so what we see here is the df dot show is showing us the the table. Okay, so it has figured out that this data that you see, that that you data that you see here, it has this is this is an object in JSON. Okay, curly brackets means JSON object, and this is the key. This is the value, meaning this is the name of the field, and this is the value. Okay, so and this is another JSON object, whereby it has two keys: one is name, other is JSON, uh, other is age. Similarly, we have third column where we have name and age. Notice that the first first record, 
first record does not have age. Still, it was able to figure out that there is a column called age in that data set. Okay. So question from David is, JSON is similar to XML? Yes, just that JSON is really, really uh, lightweight. Okay, let me just show you from this blog. So those who are wondering what are these, this is basically how we represent uh, languages. So here it says that an object in JSON is defined by curly brackets. Both sides are curly brackets, okay? Like here, we have curly brackets, okay? Curly bracket, this is a JSON object. And there, could, there would be a string colon value, then followed by a comma, and then again, uh, a string and value, right? This one. So the key has to be a string. This is what it says. Now. In in JSON, there could be there could, there could be an array. Array is how how do you define array? Array is defined as square brackets, square brackets, and a comma v, b comma c, something like this. Okay, it should look like an array in JSON is a one two three, or we could even say. Okay, there is no constraint as such that the array in JSON should have exactly the integers or only the strings. Okay, so you could have anything. Also, please note that there could be another object inside this. Okay, and further inside here as a value, it could be, it could be another, another array. So it's an array that is having these primitive values as well as one, uh, this is an object and the object is having the value as another array. Okay, so the objects can contain array, array can contain object and so on. The primitive values are these, the basic values, a string, number, object, it is a complex object here, array, this, these are the two complex objects, and then true, false, null. Okay. So a question from David is that where does JSON fit into your diagram? JSON is just a format, it's a generic format. It is not too specific with the respect to the big data. All right, like for example, in here, when you see the browser, <clears throat> in the browser, this is the console where you could define JSON object. Okay, so you could define where X equals an array. Okay, this is this is your. Um, you can actually say, and you can actually convert it into, into a JSON object. Okay, so so basically the the browser and everybody works on JSON. JSON comes from JavaScript object notation. All right, so you could have all kinds of. Um, things this is this looks a little complicated but if you take a look at it closely say for example what is a number number could have an optional negative sign be before it or it could be no negative sign then followed by either the zero or uh, or the the number could either begin with this my negative sign or no negative sign followed by zero and or it could be one to nine digits then then after one to nine digit, there could be any other digit. Okay. If it is a zero, then you don't have a, after zero, you don't have anything, any digit. You you must have uh, you must have dot. So you don't you can't have things like zero one for dot one. Okay. So that's what it shows. Zero followed by dot. Okay, if you have digits like from one to nine, it is another thing is called afterwards, there are more and more digits. Then we have uh, here after dot, there is another digit and so on. So, so you can take a look at the JSON format. This is all right. 
All right, a question from Binta is, could you show us the diff syntax difference between regular SQL, Hive, and Spark SQL? Let's talk about it towards the end where we will interact with Hive using Spark SQL. You'll get the picture, picture really clear. Sandeep, I'm getting some error while executing this command. Okay, what is the error? Can, you, can I share my screen? Uh, yeah, you show me. All right, I'm hoping that others will mind. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, can you can you press uh, enter? Let me just take a look. So what, what did you do here? Okay, you are on F. All right, yeah. all right. Did you do export, export? Yeah, I, I exported these two files. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, can you, can uh, yeah, I, actually I gave you a different command. Can you just use that one, please? I gave you a different command. So here, this is the one I'm talking about. So instead of using 2.2.1, can you use 2.0.2? So directly spark shell? Do you see this one? Uh, all right. Uh, just uh, take a look at the chat I've shared with you. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'll show you the one I'm talking about. So use this particular command, spark, spark, spark 2.0.2, .2, that's the one you should use, all right? So on bash, you should use this, okay? And then on scalar prompt, use this. The implicits are not really mandatory. They are just used in, in some circumstances that we generally use this. So you don't need this actually, the second part right now. You don't need to run this. You can skip this part completely, okay? So, all right, just to, to run this, you just use these three commands on the shell, that's all. All right? Great, great. So moving ahead and all right. So we were able to load JSON, JSON file as our data frame. We were able to create a data frame out of it. To see, to take a look at the data frame, we use df.show. Df is our variable name. <clears throat> you could use any other variable name here. And, um, oh. This guy has quit. Okay. Let me increase the font. Okay, great. So let's move ahead. Now, the original JSON was this. This was the raw text file having the JSON format. And while we use uh, spark.read.json, we were able to load JSON into the data frame. All right. Now, we can take a look at the schema in more detail. So we could always say df dot print schema, all right? So here it shows the age and the name as the two columns, as well as the data type of those two columns. Age is integer long and name is a string, all right? So so these are the two columns that it has inferred from the from the JSON file. Okay. Moving ahead now. All right. So if you let's say you only want a particular column, you could say df.select and we could say age and then show. So this way we can select a particular column. All right, as well as we could say name. All right, so, so basically just like SQL, it provides you the way of selecting a particular column using the select function. Then we have a little bit more complex mechanism of selecting. Let's say you want to, you want to create a dynamic column. 
you want to create a dynamic column such as uh, adding one to the age. Okay, so we can do that by putting a dollar sign, by putting a dollar sign fo followed by the string in the double quote. That means we are trying to refer a particular column, column's value. And here, when we say this, it is going to evaluate this expression. This is what it means. Okay. So you can see that it has created, it has created the, also you can just skip this part. Sorry, not like this. You could just say, no, okay. Let me just show you what I was saying. Okay. So it says that uh, overloaded method select. Okay. So if you have more than one argument or where we are passing a evaluated value, you have to put dollar. Okay. So dollar is needed when you are using dollar in either of the columns. All right. So this way. A uh, question from Bitta is df dot select dollar name plus a. Okay, all right. Let's just try that. I think it does not provide us a way to append a string. All right. So it says that. Okay, the name of the column is that. Interesting. All right. Okay. So never mind. So we will we'll talk about a little bit more uh, involving examples. What will happen in this case? Interesting. So it's basically taking care of the dot plus part so does it look at dot i really have no idea in this one okay the special format it's taking here mm -hmm. never mind so we will we'll see more easier examples here all right so the select syntax i'm not sure how to do concatenating of the strings it should be easy. Okay, let's just move ahead. There are some more filters. It, it, it provides a syntax for filter. Okay, such as if I want to check if the age is, if the age is greater than say 30. Okay, then show. All right, there is no age which is greater than 30. And let's take a look. So there is one person, Andy, whose age is greater than 20. All right, so this way we can operate the filter methods on data frame. Okay, and uh, the next one is the we can do group by. Okay, we can do group by, although I'm not a big fan of this kind of way. I'm more comfortable with SQL. So here we could do say group by and whatever comes as out of the group, we are run, running an aggregator called count and then we are showing that, okay? So so that's, that, that's the outcome. This is equivalent of saying select is count star from data frame group by age, all right? So it provides you many functions, DF, just like SQL, it provides you all kinds of functions like it has joins, it has select, it has a union, and it has the function called 2df. Uh, sorry, this function it will be used in the other case I'll talk about. And uh, then we have print schema, group by, group by key, and so on. So that's, that's about the data frame. Now, Sometimes, uh, as we just saw, that uh, it was a little tricky. It was a little tricky to use the syntax like select, group by, and filter. 
so it's generally better <clears throat> all right is the voice coming through fine now change the position of headphone now oh all right i think this will be fine right wow if i put the headphone in in my neck uh, it doesn't work well if i put it on my head it works well okay that's the directional issues i have no idea uh all right so great now let uh, what we just saw was that uh, it it does provide you group by filter and other things but it doesn't provide as sophisticated sql as we wanted right so for that what they have done is they have provided you a mechanism to execute sql and this is really powerful feature this is really powerful feature and okay a uh, question from bintao is that if you when you uh, when you press df dot it doesn't work but for me try this one what i've done is i've said df dot and press tab twice and of course i have defined my data frame like this now uh, using that using the spark dot read json so i press tab twice only then it comes okay that's the auto complete it actually comes even once when you press even once then also it comes yeah not enter you have to press tab okay so we'll look at it uh, after some time all right so now how to run sql queries on top of data frame so the, it's very very simple all you have to do is you just have to register your data frame as a particular view okay as a particular view so i'm going to show you this so df is our data frame name and we are saying register this df with the name called people okay so now people has been registered as a temporary view now how to use this view using this kind of command okay whatever name you gave earlier for this data frame right you are using select star from people okay so you can say sql or you can just simply say um here or let me just show you some something okay let let's just finish this part so sql df dot show so you see that so spark provides you a way to register any data frame as a view so that you can run sql commands using spark.sql and that view will be available here in the query all right if you have two data frames df1 and df2 you can register them uh, together and then let's say i'm registering this one twice let's say i'm registering this as people and people one and then i'm let's say select star from people comma people one and just press enter okay let's see i think okay what was the name it should be people one okay and then show since since the sql method returns a data frame 
since this one returns data frame, we have to call show on that. So you can see that you can see that you can you can register a data frame as a view, and then once you execute that SQL, any SQL, you get another data frame. Further again, you can register that one as a data frame and then use it. So we registered the same data frame twice, and we did join on that. We did join without without giving any constraints. Okay, without giving any constraints. Okay, so here we could say where people dot age is greater than people one dot age. Oh, did I again miss? Yes. Okay, so you can see that uh, it has executed the uh, on the if you say take a look so we joined the same data frame with itself we joined the same data with frame with itself and listed down those records where the person's age is greater than the other so andy's age is greater than justin all right am i making sense to you or do you guys want a refresher on sql or Okay, sure, I'll just do history for you. So here I did, first of all, I, okay, I'll, um, I'll start from the beginning. Instead, I'll, I'll give you a proper, okay, so this is where we started. We created a data frame and then we registered it as we registered it twice one with the name with the name people and then we registered with the name okay i think from here i can give you the entire register history okay so i can just delete it This is where I made a mistake, and this is where I made a mistake again. All right. <clears throat> All right, it should work. So here we are saying df this, then we are registering this, okay? then we are executing the query and showing the results. Then we are creating another view called people one. Then we are joining the two and showing the results. Then we are joining it with a fill and putting a filter. So you can see that we could do all the magic that we did with SQL with the spark.sql. So a question from Hitendra is that does does select and from need to be in caps? Not really. In SQL, the in SQL the the syntax is uh, not really case sensitive. So you could have these as in in small or capital doesn't matter. <clears throat> So a question from Rajan is that he's facing a challenge with the read is not a member. So can you can you uh, make sure that you have executed these? Rajan and Hitendra. Did you run Spark shell as 2.0.2? Okay. Uh, don't do this part. This th this part is just for the cases where you want to create your own application. All right.
Okay. Sandeep, I think I'm still having the issue. So uh, I, I think I have to let, let me take a look, Rajan. Just give me, can you show the screen? Okay, so I think I verified that I have all the variables. So if I do a set and grab for um, all right, I have, great, I have great. Variables, and then I'm executing Spark shell. All right, wonderful. Okay, so uh, okay. Okay. So let it uh, run for a while. I doubt that the JSON does it need to be executed explicitly. Just give me a second. Okay. So here, since I already have Spark in the context, I think I just need to do this. Okay, so let me just ensure that, okay, so we, XML is there. All right. Okay, so I think it's just throwing a metadata uh, error, a metadata this, a metadata yeah. directory not found. You can say df.show. It's just a warning. Okay, yeah. it worked this time, so I, I don't know. So I think I, okay. I, okay. Okay. I did have this error. Great, great, wonderful, wonderful. So, all right, so maybe some issue with initialization, or maybe in case you have already run this, sometimes what's happening is when we are running this part, that one might be overriding the usual Spark. Okay? Okay. Great, great, wonderful. So, all right, so we were able a, to- Hi, Sandeep, yeah. I have a question on this. Go ahead. Uh, uh, it says that create or replace temp view. So does it have something to do with views or it's like a permanent table? Uh, okay. Uh, let, let me just, uh, uh, can I can I take a look at Hitendra's screen one? Yes, 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 he's please. also facing the problem. Yes, so please. yeah, I think that way all of us, well, at most I have to generally take a look at two or three screens so that the whole class solves their problem by themselves. Go ahead, Hitendra, you could share the screen if you want. I'll just take a look. In the meantime, uh, Mohammed, you could just write down your question. I would be able to answer. All right. Okay, so it says, uh, can you exit from here? Control D. Uh, just wait, press up arrow key. All right. Have you done the export of those two variables? Just use the set method as uh, Rajan was using, just to check. Set. Okay. You could just say set, set, set. And the... Yeah, that's it pretty much good. All right, so the variables look pretty fine. Now let's launch it. Yeah. 
0.2.0.2 perfect. Okay. So for some reason, I think Rajan, were you facing the same problem as uh, as uh, Hitendr? I see. I see. Maybe it is something to do with f dot cloud x lab. I'm just seeing trying that. Press enter. Um, Hitendra, let's take a look. Yeah. Uh, did it initialize really? Okay. Let's take a look again. Try the try the command. So, not like this. First, you have to do load. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. So keep going. Where? Oh, you have the copy. Where df equals spark dot read dot json. Okay. Uh, not this one. I think you have to first execute the execute that spark dot read dot json. I'll give you the commands again. Okay. Okay, so people is not found, that's right, because you have not yet registered it as a view. Okay, so first of all, you will have to create a data frame, then register it as a view, and then you can involve that particular view in your SQL queries. Okay, so I have put it on the chat. You can try those commands one at a time. The, the most recent chat from me, var df equals spark.read.json, you can try that. All right. Is that the reason or some other reason? Uh, it was failing for some other reason. Uh, Hitendra, your screen is unshared. You, do you want to share or are uh, you are done? Okay. Give it a shot. Okay, uh, so you have to first de define the DF data frame and then you have to register. The next one you see DF dot create or replace temp view. That is one thing you have to do. Okay, and then you can run the queries. So between your last two statements, you have to execute the create or replace temp view. All right. Yeah. Now run the SQL. Let's take a look. You can, is the up arrow key working? Yeah. Now you do SQL DF dot show. Looks like it is doing something this time. Great, great. So you are able to, now you can actually process any kind of data with Spark. As long as you can create data frame, you can do everything, okay? Uh, all right, there was a question from Muhammad. Question was, using raw SQL queries, 
does it create a table or view? It creates a view. It creates a view to the actual data. All right. When we say create a register temporary view, it is essentially creating that view. All right. Great, great. So should we move ahead? All right, so let's move ahead. So we were able to query the tables. Uh, we were here, right? We were able to query, even we. what we did was we registered we registered, say, same table. We, we registered the same data frame as two views, people and people one. Then we joined them. This is how you join. You just put comma between them, saying select star from people, comma, people one. This is joining. What is joining? Joining means a cross multiplication, right? A cross B, all right? So when we say people and people one, it is going to create four columns, two from people and two from people one. Okay, and whatever number, if n are number of rows in people and m are number of rows in people one, the total number of rows are going to be n into m. Now, since here it's the same data frame, the, uh, having two rows each, the total number of columns, uh, rows are going to be two into two, and that is four. All right, so for each value, of, for each row of this one, every row of this ma is matched and generated. If you put a filter, then only out of all the combinations, only those are picked where the condition is matched. Okay, where the condition is matched. So, so when we had this, it. So this is how our actual table looked like, right? Uh, sorry, I'll have to start from the beginning. This one is sampling the file and figuring out the columns. Okay, so this is that SQL uh, DF dot show. This is that table that is okay. Now we can register the same data frame as twice, and we can join the two tables. This is joining the two tables. Okay, so this is how it is. Okay, so we could do. A standard left join, right join here. Or we could even say, um, we, we, we could even say um, a complex queries here. Okay, between say these were two data frames. Let's say these were the two views created from the data frames. Data frames were created from one from RDD, other from JSON file. Then we could have used, we, we could actually join the data from all sources. So what you see is since there are three rows in each column. So three into three is total nine for all uh, from one are matched with the all from another null matched with null 30, 19. It's basically self join Then 30 matched with all of them. So this is how the rows are. This is basically a cross join. Okay. And uh, when we are, we want to let's say pick only the cases where A is, is greater than this is is greater than this is, okay? Then the case, this is the only case where this is is greater than this, okay? So in that case, you can take a look that it gives us the correct results. So this is the only case where people one dot age is greater than this. People one dot age is greater than this, all right? So this is the only case. Now, moving ahead, and so 
what we saw was uh, something that is going to be immensely powerful. That was that was the data frame. Okay. I'm going to skip the data set for now. We'll talk about data set later. There's something, another data structure called data sets. We will talk about those data sets probably later. All right. Okay. Now, these uh, four slides we'll discuss later. Let's just stay in the flow with data frame. All right. So one of the questions that Robin asked was that how do you convert an RDD into data frame? RDD is raw data in which we know the records, but we don't know what's inside the record. But in case of data frame, we have columns and we can have, we can basically do where kind of a clause. Right, we did just now where clause on the data frame. We could select the whole whole column. We could operate on the column and so on. Right. So so basically, the it's very important. While RDD provides us this immense power to even operate on music, binary file, even the the data which has only the text and so on. So RDD gives us the power of operating on raw data while data frame gives us the flexibility of operating using SQL. So if we are able to convert unstructured data to structured data, that's the process we call ETL, we are able to convert this RDD into data frame, it will be quite useful, right? So there are, there are two ways to convert the, there are two ways to convert the RDDs to data frame. First one is inferring the schema using the reflections. First one is inferring the schema using the reflections. All right. Second one is programmatically specifying the schema. All right. All right. We'll talk about both the, both approaches. So Spark SQL can convert an RDD with case classes to a data frame. So all we need to do is create an RDD with case classes and then use two data frame function to create the data frame. It's as simple as that. Whatever is the name of the objects, so case class is nothing but usual class. So whatever is the name of classes, name, name of variables in the classes, those will become the columns. All right. Those will become the columns. Now let's uh, give it a try to convert people.txt into data frame. Okay, so you could try this particular piece of code I had uh, written earlier. So here we go. All right, so, so what we are doing here is this is something that is usually good to have. I'll explain the significance of it later. In casting, it is use, useful. Now here, what we are doing is we are we are creating a class. We are creating a class called person, which has name and age. All right, which has name and age. All right. Also notice that this is a different file. This is a different file called people.txt. We are loading this people.txt into an RDD using our usual method called sc.txt file, right? So we have this RDD, text.rdd. All right. So I'll talk about the significance of this class very soon. So this is our this is our the text file and you can see that it is essentially having a single string okay we said take one it gave us this string all right so it's an array of strings as in an array this one is a single element all right you could you could take a look at this so it's a single single element okay and so it has loaded the text file into every record. Now we can split the text data by comma. So we got array RDD. Take a look at array RDD. Say take one. 
it has split it this time into these things. All right. Next is that we are. Next is that we are in the array uh, RDD. We are mapping the attributes to the person class. Okay. So here, what we are doing is we are converting. We are converting this this array of values into our person classes object. All right. All we are trying to do is convert our raw data in the RDD into the object. Okay. Why? Because in object we have data type in object we have the name of the every variable as well as their data type therefore it'll be easy to convert that convert that rdd to a data frame because while converting what it'll do is it'll pick up the column names and data type from the object definition all right so now let's convert this array let's convert this array into into um into a into an object of person. So here we are saying that attributes we are mapping this we are executing map and for every every set of attributes which is Michael and 29 we're, we're creating an object of person class. We are passing the 0th value of attribute which is name and the first value of the attributes which is 29 and we are trimming it and then we are calling two integer on it. Okay. So this way, person uh, RDD is created. So you can say take one. All right. So you can see that uh, it is basically converted into person object. Now moving ahead. So finally, we can call the simple method called to data frame and we will have the people df. So this simple method so we converted the raw data into objects and then from objects it is able to convert it into data frame okay so it's pretty simple all you need to do is map your uh, rdd into object and then objects of a case class then you will be able to convert it using simply the two data frame okay so you can see that So the purpose of a case case class is nothing but a class. And if you are able to convert your RDD into the into the objects of a class, then it will be simply picking up the name of the various attribute, making them columns, as well as setting the correct data type. All right. Uh, can a CSV file also be converted in a similar way? This is uh, yeah. This is CSV file only. People.txt is like a CSV file. That's correct. Uh, as you can see, as I was showing earlier, it was basically a CSV. Split on comma. Yes. Split on comma. Right. Yes. So Sandeep, um, can you can you say like at what point we are reading from the disk? So so if I understand correctly, at line number seven is when it's going to hit the file system and read it from the file, right? Because it's... Uh, uh, we, in this in this page, are you able to see yes. the screen? Yes. In th this page. Oh, okay, very good question. Okay. Uh, so which one do you think it would? At line seven, right? Until line uh, seven, it's definition. This one is? A... No, 2DF, correct. Line number eight. That's right. So at line number eight, it's, it's actually hitting the file system. Yeah. So, so like, it. it's... Yeah, again, it's here when we say 2DF, it's basically going to not hit the uh, file system. I'll show you this. So when we say this, it just does a bit of sampling. That's all. Okay. And okay. nothing more than that. 
this is the time where it actually hits the file system. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah. So here, two data frame, when we are doing that, it's not going to do the entire translation. It's going to just figure out the name of the columns and data type by sampling this RDD. Okay, so yeah. Okay. Uh, good question very good question can you explain uh, six and seven six is converted uh, array rdd into map yeah this one is what text rdd text rdd each record is each, each record, record is is yeah. map key value pair each record is a text line yes right yeah. each record is a single line and the the whole rdd is basically made up of those lines right if there are a million lines that is unstructured file, data correct yes this is unstructured data this will have 1 million records yeah. right now if there are 1 million file, 1 million lines here and then uh, 1 million lines in this file now what we are doing is we are saying for each line right for each line execute this function what it does is for each line, it's going to split the line by comma. That's all. All right. So every line will become the will. So how many records will it have? Same as before. Why? Because it, it, we are using map. So every line is going to be broken down into an array. So this one is nothing but instead of plain text line, the this contains each record is an array object. Okay. Yeah. So afterwards here at this point we're converting this array by using map we're converting this array into person object but how we do uh, fetch from the line the person person data uh, from the line this is your line from, right from the file from the yeah from the rdd how we can uh, come again i need to we are this. fetching the person data actually here Right. Yes. So this is person's data, right? People.txt. Yeah. Okay. Seventh line, seventh line. Okay. Yeah. This one, right? Yeah. We basically converting, converting this array into an object. Every, every element of this array, this array RDD is an array, right? Every even element word. Of, even what? a word, word also an object, single word. Array yeah. RDD, array RDD just split the line with the split the line with comma separate right. the line with comma right, right. Okay. then array RDD each in array RDD each uh, each item will be converted into object correct okay okay so in array RDD th this one is nothing but an uh, array of arrays. Okay, RDD is an array of arrays. Each each uh, element or each record is an array, and then we are converting that array into this object, each one of them, right? Okay. Okay. Great. Great. So you can visualize it this way. Um, I was assuming that I remember there was an example about notification. Whether it's of type email or it's of type SMS, we use case classes over there. That's correct. So, aren't we using the case class to see if that line is of type person over here? That's very good. So, yes. So, that's basically handling the error in case of parsing. Is that your question, right? Yes, yes, yes. Correct. So, what if, what if let's say, a particular line is yeah. not in this format, the correct which format. we are expecting? Right. right. So in those cases, yes, we'll have to handle those either by using case class or matching ma using the case matching and so on. We'll have to do that. All right. All right. So what was the this one is very having, rudimentary. What was the purpose of having a case class over here? Yeah. So th if there are two things we are talking about. One is case matching. There is a way to matching match the object type. That's also type? called case. Okay. Right. That's also a case case match uh, kind of a syntax. Mm -hmm. Right. Here, the case class refers to kind of a quick class. Okay. It's kind of a quick class instead of you defining a full full blown class with two string and all that. 
you're just defining case class like this. This is like a shortcut to create a class. Oh, so this is like a shortcut to create a class. Okay. And yes. what would like, would there be an issue if one of the records would have an extra field? What would will have an extra field? field? What I mean is if supposing a record has three attributes instead of two. Then there won't be a problem. But if there are lesser attributes, then the, here you will get array index of bound. Okay, because you are just accessing the first and the second attribute. That's so right. if there are more, then there's no problem. But if, it is, if there are less, then yeah, there is a problem. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Sandeep, this dot map is converted into an array. No, dot map is a function provided on RDT. Yeah. Okay. In, a, in a six line dot map, because array RDT is just a variable name. We can give any name. That's correct. Yeah. So map is converted into a key value pair. This is a standard RDD map is converted into key value where uh, what I'm talking about. So I'll, I'll t tell you again. So I'll just show you. So TXT RDD, what does it contain? TXT RDD, let's just uh, do collect. Okay, do collect and get the idea. So TXT RDD is this. Okay, how many elements are there in this? TXT RDD dot count. Okay, so how many elements are there? Three elements, one, two, and three. Okay, if you want to take a look at the actual file, you can use Hadoop FS cat, all right, txt. So this is our actual file. This is our actual file, okay? All right, so let me just explain. So this is our actual file. This is line one, this is line two, and this is line three. This is our txt file, okay? Now what we are doing is we are creating an RDD out of it. Let me just draw an RDD. Okay, it has record one, record two, and record three, correct? Now let me put it here, okay? This is our three records, right? So this one is, uh, let me just explain to you. So when we say, when we say sc.txt file, this is what happens, sc.txt file, okay? Text file. Now, from this, from this, what we are doing is on, so each one, please notice that each one is um, each one is a text line. This is a line. This is a text line. Okay, uh, right here. If you access this and say, "Give me this particular character," you'll get that character. All right. Now each line is a text right now. Now let's break it down by using say map and using split. Okay. So what will happen is, let me just copy this part. All right, like that. Okay, so we have this. What it is doing is basically, uh, instead of this way, I'll basically uh, write something like this. Okay, I think this way you can visualize better, right? So this record, this record here became an array like this, okay? This became a record like this. All right, so, and let me just put it properly. And so on, correct? So here also the square brackets and here also the Okay, so this is an array of values and so is this one. Good. So every record has been split. 
So this method called split has been called how many times? Three times. This will return an array. Yes. Okay. You can try this if you, all right? You can try this separately. You could say uh, here, you could say uh, A comma B and a split. Sorry, not here, on the console. This is a usual, usual um, scalar syntax. Okay, so you could try that. So you can see it has broken it down into this. Good? Yeah. All right, you can see. Correct. All right, now, is it clear now? So yeah. afterwards, afterwards, we are converting each yes. one of them into, uh, say, using map, this will be become, all of these will become person object, okay? All of these will become person object. Okay, after this, this will become person, okay? This will become person and something of this sort, okay? Remove the array. I think this will make you clear. So if you, it's important to be able to visualize it this way. All right. And essentially this is what is happening. So we are creating person object with this way. Uh, what happened to this guy? All right, so I hope this makes it clear. This is one person, this is another person, and this is another person. Okay, so this is what's happening at this stage where we are saying this particular code. Okay, so another map. This is another map where all of these arrays are, arrows are basically executing the same code. All right? Yeah. Okay. Great, great. Um, very good question, uh, Robin. Let me uh, uh, speak the question from Robin. I'm curious if there is a code to convert data frame in CSV file format into Excel format into an Excel format application. Yes, there would be something. The, and if you notice here, the same kind of syntax that we used earlier here, uh, if, you, if you go back, uh, we what, what did we use? We used this, right? Um, Read.json, right? You could actually use the same command here also saying CSV and say show. All right, so this is like cool uh, way of um, parsing the CSV file. Spark, I've installed this plugin um, called CSV file plugin. It says the multiple sources are found for CSV. So we have to say, all right, I'll talk about this again after a while. Okay. A proper, this one is a little buggy because uh, this one, uh, the way we are doing is we are assuming that our name and other things, name and other things are not containing comma. If the names or other column, any other columns are containing comma, then this will split the, split the individual cell value. That may not be what we are looking for. All right, for those ca cases, we'll talk about how to load C proper CSV file. Right. A question from Bintao is case classes look like a function for map to act on array identity and work out of data for the schema of case class. Yeah. Yes, basically it figures out the schema for the data frame from the case class. I think that's what you meant to say. Yes, name of the class is person, that's right. All right, wonderful set of questions moving ahead and we were able to successfully, we were able to successfully, successfully do all these steps, right? 
Now, once we have created this, we have created this uh, data frame, then we can do the rest of the process. We can say register it like a view and then call, call it on the, you can call the SQL on top of it. And uh, you can see we are able to say where age is between 13 and 19. Great. I have another question on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that like data frame, like the, the process of converting RDDs to data frames would mm -hmm. work best only for semi-structured data or structured data, but not for unstructured data. Okay. Why do you think so? Uh, like I was just, like I was wondering how would we convert like an image data to a data frame? on what basis correct correct so so yes so that's exactly the 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 important question so see first first converting images to a data frame would not make much sense right correct because the columns there are no columns at all that's right that's right unless we are converting one pixel per column like in case of machine learning algorithm where each pick, let's say there are hundreds of images, let's say in case of standard example of machine learning, what we do is we process around 60,000 images, right? Out of those mm -hmm. 60,000 images, we what we do is we convert them into columns such that each pixel becomes a becomes a column. So it, the, the data frame in those cases contains 784 columns. The size All of right? the image. Yes, the whole image, we make it a state array. Each row is an array and each pixel value is a column. Mm -hmm. In those cases, we can convert an image into a data frame. All right, so that's basically for classification? Correct. Like what kind of algorithms? Classification? classification or any other uh, neural network or say we are trying to resize an image to a lower resolution and so on okay so there are mm -hmm. there are many use cases of uh, handling converting an image into columns the the point here is that there could be cases and we may want to you take care of that part as well all right mm. so uh, like another quick question on this so data free so for applying machine learning algorithms data frames is a useful data structure yes yes so it's good to have your data in tables that's for correct. apply machine learning algorithms that's correct that's correct because whenever we are feeding the data into algorithms we would like to tell that these are our objects and these are their features meaning whatever data we feed to the algorithm we want to tell that this is individual entity that we are feeding and these are its qualities okay and on this basis do the prediction on something Generally, so we try to feed structured data correct okay all right so that's why the that in general that, that's the idea and that's why more the whole mllib library of spark has moved to the data frame api okay mm -hmm. All right, so in MLLib, uh, data frames is like the basic data structure Correct. in order to process. That's right. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Great. A question from David is, how can I send you a file? Uh, you want to send me a file? Okay. You can just send me at, um, okay, great. Thank you. You want me to open it right now or you have sent it? Uh, okay. Let me just pause the screen for a moment. Uh, All right, this is nice. Thank you so much. And all right, so can you see the screen? Yes, this is the person class that we are using here. We're good. And this is the text RDD that we're using here. And this array RDD is the one that we created in the previous step. And this person RDD is the one that we created in the previous step. Good, good. 
what tool are you using there? Let me just make a note of it. Probably I could also use this one. Thank you so much um, for sharing this. All right, let me just make a note of it. Okay. All right, let me make a note to myself. Great, wonderful. Yes, so your understanding is correct. And I think this would help others also. So here we are defining the person class and here we're using it. Here we are creating the RDD. This is where we're using it. Here we are creating array RDD. This is where we're using it. And this is where we are creating the person RDD. And this is where we are using it. Is that what you meant to express? So uh, Sandeep, generally map will reduce an array. array. Map will? will? Will return an array. No, map will uh, return an RDD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So not always. Uh, so here, in this case, it uh, converts each record into an array. Here, in this case, case it converts an array into an object. Correct. So, so there is no correlation as such. But generally, Amanda, what map map return an RDD? Yes, that's correct. All right. This is a lazy evaluation. So these map and this map in the real runtime, they're going to be combined together. Okay, combined together because it is a lazy evaluation and both the piece of code are going to be merged together at the runtime. All right. But they are accessing at the index value zero one. They're accessing at index the value. Attribute zero, attributes one. Yeah, this one, yes. Yeah, at the index. Yes. Zero so, one. So see, this is an RDD, right? This yeah. is an RDD. It has many records. Yeah. Individually, what we have done is this split method is of our scalar method. It yeah. converted each line into an array. Okay. It has nothing much to do with map. Whatever you tell map to execute, map will do that. Okay. But it is overall is it is complete is RDD, but each line is an array. Here, this is also an RDD. This is also an RDD. This one, this one is also RDD. This one is uh, text lines. This one is uh, RDD of array. That's right. And this one is a area RDD of persons. So map is written an RDD of an array. RDD. Yeah. In this case, it returned an RDD of array. While in this case, it returned an RDD of person objects. In this case, uh, in yeah. That's what it did. All right. We have two maps here. This is also another map. Okay. So map doesn't always return uh, uh, this kind of thing. Here it's returning a singular object as well. Okay. So it basically translate one RDD into another RDD, translating one each record into something else. All right. But running a map, map, if we say that it in map definition is like it return an RDD, simple. That's correct. It returns an RDD running the function that you have passed to it Depends again and function. again, again and again on yeah. every record. So this function will be executed n number of times where n is the total number of records in an RDD. All right. Okay. Good, good. All right, so rest is you can you can operate on the data frame. Once you have been able to create a data frame, you can register it like a view and uh, you can you can execute the query and so on. All right, so so this is what we are trying to show you. Further, we could convert that as a string forcefully. Here we are saying get as a string. So we are converting it as a string and so on. All right, so here this part where we are while converting it something into a string we could register register the map or anything as a encoder here this map is the data structure map it's not that rdd transformation map so in case let's say there is a list of values and we would like to translate we would like to translate that okay 
we'd like to retrieve those, then we'll have to register the encoder. So let's say what we are doing is here, we got the data frame. Okay, this is something a little more involved, I'll explain. So let's say this is our data frame, correct? So how does the data frame look like? It has name and the age. Name is Justin, age is 19, uh, okay? So, so if we want to, if you want to say convert it, convert each values into the map, okay, then we can use this kind of mechanism. All right, we can run our usual map functions on our data frame. That's what uh, we are trying to show you here. Okay, so unable to find here, uh, what we are, we are trying to do multiple things here we are calling a method called map. What it does is it executes this, this function on, on each of the record. So we are saying get values map. So for every object, get the values map, okay? All the key and the value. And then, and then we are trying to cast it to basically get values as a map as in, uh, all right, so this is basically, how should I demonstrate to you? So let's say we have person class, right? Person is SG and it has, right? This is my person object. Now I can say get values map, okay? All right, no, actually this is coming from implicits. This is something that's coming from implicits. Okay, so we are going to register it here. So here we are saying that register this particular encoder, encoder, uh, and then use that value. So um, I think this will come again after a while. Here what we wanted to show you is that if you want to if you want to translate some value into something, then you can use the encoding. This is a right way of using encoding. We just basically register a cryo encoder here so that the translation is really fast. All right, so that's what we are trying to do. For now, let's just leave it here and then we'll come back to it probably at a later point of time. So we can convert, we can basically register an encoder. If you register an encoder, then you get the functions like get values as a map and you can translate the object into values. So here the object has been converted into a map of key values. Sandeep question. Yes, go ahead, Hitendra. Yeah, uh, where did you define teenager class? We did not define teenager class. Teenager is just another person. All right. Teenager, uh, making that as a class over here. Yeah. So teenager is a record here. It's not. A, it's not even a person. It's just a record. All right. So you could say tf dot map. Okay. And uh, let's say. Uh, so here, th this basically. Uh, uh, sorry. This is essentially uh, something called a row object. We'll talk about this one again. So here we actually jumped a couple of steps ahead. So on a data frame, you can execute map method. Now data frame is a table structure. The map method, what does this mean here? Each row is what you get here. This is a row, row object internally and then row object is being converted here. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So teenager is a variable of, no, the teenager is a row type. So again, um, here there are multiple things that are happening. So, all right. So I think this is just jumped too much ahead. Okay. We'll have to. Yeah. So here, uh, the important part to understand is that that here, the on the table, 
on the table you can call main method you can on the data frame you can call map and it would basically it would basically uh, give you the give you the the row object and that row object has man, man, many methods on that row object you can uh, all right let me just demonstrate to you probably this come this will help you understand so whatever we did as part of say using rdds we had methods like map flat map and so on the similar methods are available on the table the only difference is only difference is that we get we we, we get the we get the row object instead of instead of the actual data so here it's a row object and uh, in the row object you have the methods like uh, you can access like an array row 0 and you can you can display it so here it's creating another data frame from one data frame by using map converting each row into a newer row where the newer row is having a string like this all right that's so row is. an array row is like an array is an extension of an array okay okay so data frame provides a method like map in which you can you can operate on row level in case you don't have a function provided by any of these methods let's say you want to compress a file you want to reverse a string and so on if let's say the sql doesn't provide those functions or other methods like select methods don't provide those functionality you can just use the raw map and and translate translate each row into something else okay so sandeep in a map whatever we pass if whatever you give a function that it will return that like in array it can return it can return a string it can return a row right okay it can return anything okay okay so map is a meta function here whatever function here we are providing an inline function this is called inline function this function is going to be called on every record and whatever is the result is going to be collected and new data frame will be created out of it okay so if we store in a rdd so it can we can say rdd of array rdd of strings or rdd of rows perfect yes all right great let's take a break for 10 minutes and we will be right back great so let's get started and uh, yes so this is where we were we were talking about we were talking about this part where all right so we were where is that piece of land that okay okay so every record every row we are converting that row as a values map and all we are trying to do is extract name and age from every row that's what we are trying to do okay so if you want to convert the each row into a hash table or hash map we can use this kind of mechanism just that you will have to register register the map up front as an encoder as an encoder all right this method is from the row object of the row object of the of the um, of the data frame api all right now So is everyone back? Are you able to hear me? Great. All right, then it's cool. All right, so now here, how did the data frame got constructed? Data frame got constructed by using 2DF function, which essentially, which essentially probed, probed the RDD and inferred the name of the column and the data type of the column from your class object from your person object right so 
in the method that we have discussed so far, we it is mandatory to create a case class upfront, upfront at the time of coding. When you are writing the code, you have to define the case class. And while defining the case class, you have to mention the name and the various name of the parameters as well as their data type, right? That's what you mentioned while defining the case class. What if you don't know? What if you don't know the number of fields that are going to be in the production? For example, number of fields are being read from separate file and you want to load the data, you want to load the name of the fields from a separate file. You can't create the class object. You can't create the case class dynamically from, from, that, from that file, correct? So when, when case classes cannot be defined during the time of coding, like the fields expected in case classes and are passed as argument, right? Somebody is, uh, at the dynamic at the uh, uh, dynamic time the at the time of running the fields names are are coming either as input from the user or from the argument from the file or somewhere else all right so in that case we instead of inferring the schema automatically we will have to design the schema programmatically all right, before proceeding further, Raju is saying why we need an encoder here. Whenever we want to get something, uh, a, a complex object back, we need to define an encoder. All right. All right, so we'll, we'll come back to that, that later. Uh, let's uh, continue here. So question is, um, we need to programmatically create the data frame. So these are the three steps. These are the three steps that we need to define while in automatically or programmatically specifying the schema. First of all, we create an RDD of row object. Earlier, we created an RDD of the person or, or you can say the case class object, correct? This time, you have to create the RDD of row objects. And then we create the schema represented by a class called struct type. Then first we create the row object. Then the next thing we do is we create the schema using struct type class. And then once we are done with creating a schema, what is schema? The name of the columns and their data types is a collection of all of those is a schema. Now, then we can apply the schema with create data frame method. Say we have people.txt, txt, and it has Michael comma 29. And let's say dynamically, the user is entering the name of the column like name and age. So this val schema string is dynamically inputted from the user. So, so in this case, first of all, we'll do the usual imports. We'll do the usual imports. Then, then we will then we will basically here, we will split this schema, uh, right? So this is the schema string, the name of the columns separated by space and name of the columns separate by space. And we are splitting, splitting the, the, this string by space. So this is a fields array, name and age is the fields array. Then we are converting this fields array into struct type. Okay, we're converting this into struct type. All right, so here, what we are doing is, right, since we don't, this one, though we have specified in the code, this could be inputted from the user as argument to your program, or you can read it from the file. You don't explicitly need to define the case class object upfront. Right? Because when you're defining a case class, you need to know exactly what parameters are going to be there. So if you have dynamic kind of environment where you don't know right now what are the things that user is going to enter, therefore you'll have to come up with the programmatically specifying the schema. In the previous example, the, the person class we had created upfront, right? There was no teenager class, right? 
And um, all right. So here, here, okay. A uh, good, good question. So let me just walk you through step by step. So this is interesting case. And what we are doing is we are, let's say, first of all, importing the the various types. This is the, these are going to be used. And this is the data that is going to be inputted by the user. Here we have defined in the code. Okay. This is the file name. All right. And then we are defining schema string dot split. So here this split is happening locally. We have converted this list into an array. Then on this array, using Scala, using Scala, we are converting this array into struct fields. This is a local array. This is not an RDD or this is not nothing. This has this is not on Spark. So what we have done is we have created an array we have created an array of struct fields. What does struct field has? Struct field has the name. F represents each of the name. This function is going to be called once for name and once for age. Okay. And notice that for both of them, we are saying that both of name and age are of string type. And we are passing the name here. So we are creating a struct type field with the name and the age and nullable label equals true. So we are essentially defining the columns just like we define in case of creating a table. Okay, so here we have created this field array that contains array of struct fields. Struct field represent each of the columns. And then we are defining the schema by passing this array to struct type object. So this struct type is essentially a collection of struct fields, just like you have table schema, collection of columns. Similarly, struct type is a collection of struct fields. Okay, struct fields, each of them contains name and the data type of each file, each column, right? So what we have done is we have created the entire schema. All right, then, then here we are usually loading our data as as we did earlier and here the important part is so we are saying sc.txt file let's just say sc.txt file again it's the same thing That's correct, Alok. It is supposed to be of integer type, but right now, for simplicity, we have just taken that to be string type, okay? Because we want, it, let's say from another another file, we are getting the data type of each of these. That could be dynamic. All right, so here, we have loaded the people's RDD as a, a normal text file, you could take a look at it by using collect, by using collect. It's a array of strings, meaning this RDD is a array, it is individually, it is array, this is an RDD of strings. This is one string, this is another string, and this is third string, all right? So we have created the usual RDD now we are converting this rdd of the strings into rdd of row objects so we are saying split each line split this with comma okay once we are done with splitting it then again run the map and the way we earlier converted attributes into person object this time we are converting them into the, into a row object Row from sequence is um, basically this takes uh, something like this, okay? Sorry, we have to say things like array. So you can see it converts, this basically converts an array of values into a SQL row, Spark SQL row, row object. Okay, so this one converts this array of scalar 
into the row object. So every each of the RDD records will get converted into into the into the row. Okay. So you can see here um, when I say row RDD, okay, it is basically an array when it we collected locally. It's an array of row, and each of the rows look like this. All right, once we have uh, created the row RDD, and we can apply the schema that we created earlier on the, uh, and create the data frame. So this was our RDD of rows, RDD of Spark SQL rows, and this is our schema. We are combining the two and then creating the data frame. Now we have the data frame. All right, so we are able to create the data frame from dynamically loading the fields. All right. Uh, Sandeep, I have a question over here. Yes. Uh, we had a function, I think it was called infer schema and it, it would infer the schema by itself. Correct? Infer schema. Okay. Infer schema, I think I had seen it in the code that you had shown. Then why would um, we programmatically need to specify the schema? No, there was no infer schema. We were saying that it will infer the schema from the case class here, right? So here, if you take a look, we define the person class, right? Mm -hmm. So th from this, this object, all we did was we converted our RDD into the objects of person class. That's yes. all we did. Right, okay. and when the when we did say two data frame, it automatically inferred the schema. How? Because every person class has the name and the data type. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So what if yes. we don't have this luxury of creating the class right now? Because at the mm -hmm. coding time, we don't know how many fields are going to be there in production. Correct. 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 Okay. So. Okay, great. so there is no inbuilt function which. Infers the schema by itself. No, basically it internally does the inferring. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. So that was first part. Let me just start with the second part. All right, now we are going to go over a little bit more methods and uh, let's just uh, start here. Okay, so let's say you have an XML file. You have an XML file. Let me go to my second tab and show you how does the XML file looks like. Okay, so this XML file is of this kind, okay? It's a catalog. It is starts with XML and this catalog is of book. Each book has an ID. Okay. Each book has an ID. Let me share the share the slides with you. Okay. Each book has an ID. Inside each book, these are the attributes of the book. Okay. It has author, title, genre, price, and so on. Right, and you have description, you have authors, and so on. So you can see that the book is the one node under the catalog. So catalog is made up of books. So if you want to, if you want to present this as a data frame, what will be the row you would like to have? Quickly, what will be the row representing? Book ID, the author, the title, the journal. Book, yeah. Each book will be one row, correct? And all the attributes of the book will be the columns, correct? So let's see if we can use Spark SQL to load our XML file. Now here, we are starting with, say, Spark XML. This time, I'm going to exit my uh, Spark SQL, 
and launch it again, although this XML would be loaded. Now, this is an interesting thing that we're doing here. So here, what we are showing doing is we are starting a Spark shell with an extra command, an extra argument called packages. So you can launch Spark shell or Spark submit with packages argument, and it will download this package from the internet. It will download this package from the internet. All right. So, so we are loading it with the with the Spark XML package. Or we can actually use it with Spark 2.0.2. I think 2.0.2 is also fine. What was the version we used earlier? Okay. Two dot zero dot two is also fine, or zero dot one is also fine. The only difference this time is we are passing an extra argument called Spark XML. All right. And here there is a very simplified code, very simplified code, which says, okay, I'll just break it down into parts. The, here we are saying spark.read, then format is XML. So this is our format. And then on the format, we are specifying the option that what is it that is considered as the row tag. So here we are saying that each row each row, row will be, be a book. So book tag will become the row and we are saying load this XML file. Okay, so let's take a look if it works. All right. And the, what does option mean? Road tag and book? Yeah. Mean the rows? Yeah. So here, yes, that's correct. So this format provides your method called option using which you can specify that uh, out of this data, what is it that will be considered as a row? If let's say catalog was the one that is, uh, we pass at row tag, what will happen is the whole thing will become a single, uh, single row. Okay, so here we are saying use the book as our row tag. All right, we can use multiple like we can use as many as we can. No, we can we have to specify only one. No, you have specified here two row tag and book. Yeah, so no, no. So we are saying row tag is book. Okay, and book only. Yes, we are saying we are telling it spark that hey, our row when you are going through my XML, wherever you see the tag called book, that means it is a row. All right. We if have there are multiple rows then? Yeah, it will consider all of them as a separate row. It has multiple row only, right? Then it has we have multiple to rows. It. Yeah, that's what we have mentioned. Yeah, I mean, so, okay. So, okay, so see the, the challenge here is, this is an XML, correct? Yeah. Which one should it consider at a row, as a row? Is this a all of this data inside catalog is a single row Correct. till here, or yeah. or this is the row? Okay. Yeah. So that's the one that we have just defined here. If we say catalog, catalog, there will be only one 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 record. Yeah. All right. Great. So you can see each book has become one record. Each book has become one record. Make sense to you? All right. So this way, or 
The same thing could be done using spark.read and then we could provide the entire name instead of only XML, we could provide the entire package name like this com.databricks.spark.xml and then we can provide the rest of the data that the way we have defined earlier. Okay, here of course the location of the file is going to be the same. Yes. All right, let's move ahead. So we have successfully loaded the XML data. All right, so Next question is that uh, we are going to use uh, the term R RPC again and again. RPC is nothing but remote process call. When you're building your service, when you're building your service, you want your service to be consumed by all kinds of client, be it phones, be it browsers, be it bots, be it scripts and so on, right? So in those cases, when we are making calls, but let's say we made a call to get phone, phone book for a particular user and it should return an object. When it's returning an object, then it needs to serialize the data. For serialization, for a long time, we have used XML as the format, but XML is a very bulky format because it has starting tag, ending tag, and every time we are defining tag, right? JSON is little better because in JSON, you only have to define the tag once when we are saying name, colon, the value, right? But if you are dealing with structured data, we can define the columns once, just like CSV file, and rest of it we can interpret without mentioning the name of the column in every record. All right, so Avro is one such remote uh, one such uh, system. It's a remote process called data serialization format. Using Avro, you can serialize, you could serialize the data from a remote process, remote frame, uh, from, let's say you're building your service, you can serialize the data using Avro. It uses JSON to define the data types and the protocols as in the header of the data is defined using JSON. While the, it serializes the data, actual data without the headers in a compact binary format. It is similar to thrift and protocol buffers. There are other similar data formats like thrift and protocol buffers. And thrift is basically as a service also, as in if you want to build your own, uh, own API and services, you could use thrift or protocol buffers. Evro does not require running a code generator program. Its primary use is in Apache Hadoop where it can provide both a serialization format for persistent data and a wire format for communication between Hadoop nodes and from client programs to the Hadoop servers. So Apache Spark SQL can access Avro as the data source. Okay, so if let's say your data is formatted in the form of Avro, then you can read using Spark SQL. The only difference is here, we are using the package argument, okay? We are using the package argument, whereby it's going to, it's going to download, download the data, download these packages from internet and then launch. Okay, so this is an open source library that we are using called Spark Avro. A question from Binta is thrift and protocol buffers are also thrift and protocol buffers are also formats to serialize the data, converting a complex object into binary data or into the sequence of byte or sequential bytes that can be deserialized at later point of time that can be converted into an object at later point of time is called is called serialization. Okay, converting an object into sequence of bytes is called an in is called a serialization, right? So, Avro, Thrift, as well as protocol buffers are all serialization format. Thrift is also a software, or you can say a program that runs and serves your service to the end user. Okay. So here you go. 
All right. Now, okay. What is a binary format? Binary format is something that is made up of the characters which are not displayable, right? When we say text, what is text? Text is also binary data. Just that each of the bytes are made up of, each of the bytes are having the ASCII code of the characters which are displayable or printable characters. That's the text file, okay? But not all numbers can be presented or not all bytes can be presented as a printable characters. Therefore, the binary formats are more compact because they, they can utilize the, utilize the, the whole, um, uh, they can utilize non-printable way of saving data. All right. So, so, I'll <clears throat> Thrift and Avro both are storing the data in the binary format. Binary format examples are when you say you have a zip file, right? Dot zip file. If you don't, if you, if you don't, uh, um, if you don't, uh, if you if you don't uh, convert if you don't uh, unzip that file you may not be able to see the data similarly let's say you have this file right if you say file this it shows that it's a tar file okay now at this point if i say cat cat is for printing it it'll corrupt my screen you see the screen is corrupted this is binary data all right So that is an example of binary data. All right, so let's move ahead. Now, the serialization means to convert a file stream into bytes. Any object into bytes. Any object into bytes. Okay. okay. A whether question from stream, whether the file is stream, anything. Yes. Yes. A question from Mitha is how to display binary format data to be readable. You will have to use the corresponding corresponding tool that has created that binary because that tool would be knowing what how to present it. See, for example, we have tar file, right? Let's say we, we, we use the file command to check what is the data type. So it says that it's a tar archive. Even if you change the, let's say, name of this one, if you if, even if you change the name of this one to, to let's say, I remove tar from it, okay? I remove tar from it. Okay. And let's say I put underscore something. Now, this one is a file. We don't know what is there inside it. Correct? So we could take a, there are a couple of ways to deal with it. One, using the file command file command basically tries to tries to figure out what kind of format it is what kind of format it is right and if you take a look further so fi file command basically figures out based on the header of it it figures out what is the what is the what is there inside this particular file okay So the other way is there is a command called strings. Using that command, you could extract only the strings from a particular file. Okay, nothing more than that. All it does is it extracts the printable characters from the file. All right.
So that was how you deal with the binary files. The general thumb rule is figure out the data format and use that particular deserializer or serializer that, that command to convert the data into something meaningful, okay? All right, so now, now let's get started with the next one. I'm going to relaunch my Spark shell with different package this time called Avro. Here again, the same mechanism. Here I'm saying that load this Avro file. This is that Avro file. And if I just copy this locally, let's say Hadoop, FS, either you can use copy from local, go copy to local, or we can say get. Okay, so I'm downloading this to my home drive in the CloudX lab. Okay. All right, so here we go. So here, if you take a look at episodes using the file command, it says it's a data. It has no clue what is there inside it, okay? We could use the strings command to figure out what is there inside this data, right? So it says something like this. It says avro.schema, there is some uh, JSON header telling about the types and the other things, and then there is some data inside it, okay? So this is where the strings command is quite useful because it extracts only the printable characters and displays it. Those who are the old school like me, they would be able to recall that we used to use it for cracking the passwords long, long, long ago. As in when people would hard code the passwords into their binary, then we would generally extract using a strings command. Okay, so now the next step is that we are not here. We are going to load this. We're going to load this Avro file. Okay. Yeah. So Avro is nothing but one. All right. So it might take a bit of time to initialize the classes. So Sandeep, Avro is a special kind of format, file format. Correct, correct. Where is it generally used in real time? It's used mostly in the Hadoop related data. The extension is .avro. Generally extension is .avro, but does not matter much. In Unix, the files does not have, do not have the extension mostly, okay? Yeah. All right, great. But yeah, in general, the extension is dot .avro. So you can see that it has extracted that binary data into the data frame. All right, so we can, we can save our data into a compact format using the same mechanism. We could say here, instead of load, we could say save. Yes, avro does give, uh, yes, avro does give a bit of compression. It's a compact format. All right, so great, moving ahead. Now, we can load the data from Avro file using that. Now there is something called Paraquay or Parquay. Some, uh, we call it Parquay. Parquay is columnar storage format, meaning we store the columns first instead of rows first. Like in CSV, on the uh, physical file, first few bytes will be first row, the next few bytes will be next row, and so on. Here, 
in case of uh, parquet the it's a columnar format such that first few bytes will be first column then second column third column and so on it goes column wise to store the data in the in the file system any project in the hadoop system regardless of data processing per framework data model or programming language can use the the parquet format all right so 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 basically whenever you want to store the data in a compact format specifically if the data is really big then you would like to go for parquet while if you are building a service then you may want to go with avro okay so when it comes to handling the data from a service you generally go with avro and if you are uh, dealing with say uh, dealing with mammoth amount of data to be stored in hdfs or local storage then we go with parquet all right so so here it's pretty simple but the, the default default format in case of spark is parquet so by default the format is is considered as parquet like here we are not specifying any format we are not specifying any format and it's just loading the data frame okay all right so here so here we are using this particular loading this particular file and you can see that it is having three columns name favorite color favorite numbers name is this and color is red and the favorite numbers are these okay so we could we could load any kind of any kind of uh, parquet format easily using data frame oh, so can you please uh, can, uh, can you please cat the parquet parquet file format uh, the parquet file okay the contents this one right yeah so I here i can say hadoop fs get I'm going to get out of the habit of saying copy to local. Okay. So if you see if i do a cat right it will going to spoil my whole session so it says something called par archive data right so i can say strings all right so you could use strings and extract what is there inside it it will basically only pick the characters which are printable all right so but if you want to say take a look at what is inside say users.parquet it's actually binary data you can't figure out much from it okay Um, but like when would you transition from from avro to parquet to json to xml yeah we generally don't just don't transition too much but what happens is when you are let's say handling big data and uh -huh. you are dealing with all kinds of format right mm -hmm. so you will be given okay this folder was created using parquet format can you just load it and process it all right so okay. generally when let's say or your task will be that can you can you take this data from json format and save it as parquet okay and okay. these are the these are the fields that we want in the parquet all mm. right so the process goes as in you read parquet come to data frames then from data frames again go to json or yeah. it's there's a Correct. direct no basically uh, uh, the data frame remains at the central point Okay, it's the intermediate level. Yes, yes. All right, thank you. 
All right. Okay. So, sir, if, um, I have, I mean, I, we deal with a lot of XMLs, but I, I think I have a question on the um, books XML that you talked about. Okay, please uh, go ahead. Let's say that I have millions of books in that book XML. That's right. And, and if I store that in Hadoop, it's mm-hmm. going to split that into partitions, right? Correct. And, and it may not be a valid XML because it might arbitrarily cut the XML in between. Very good. Yes. Right. Yeah. So now if I use um, the Spark to load this into a data frame, All right. is that a problem or because I mean, I, I don't understand now that how it's going to split across Okay. Um, okay. Well, good. Good question. So, it's a, a important question, and this is something um, I have faced it uh, earlier. So, we uh, one of the customers was from Telecom, and they were keeping the configuration of each tower, each towers, each equipment in the XML, and these XMLs had grown really, really big. Okay, so I'm going to just walk you over the process because it's a it's a hard question, and um, this is something we make a lot of mistake in, right? So let's take a look at this particular um, what to say. Okay, so I'm going to just walk you over this XML, and then then I think uh, it'll make sense to you. Okay, so let me just convert this into a single line. Okay, let me just convert this into a single line and I'll just keep the title. All right, I'll just keep the title for the simplicity. And I'll make, I'll zoom it out very soon. Okay. This is this is a hard question and it has taken some time to get through. All right. Now I'm going to just take it from here. Can you see this? So this is my catalog. It has one book from here till here. It has another book from here till here. Physically, it's going to be bytes, right? In the in the book section. And let me just remove the first line for time being. Let's say this one, right? All right. So let me uh, draw it out, and then you'll get the idea. Okay. So imagine that this is our book. This is our catalog, not book. This is our catalog, and this is stored in HDFS. What is HDFS? HDFS breaks your data into blocks and these blocks could be on multiple machines, correct? So let's say from here till here, from here till here, let's say in the, say till here. Okay, this is block one, this is block one, and this is, rest is block two. This is block one, this is block two. In HDFS, this is in HDFS. You generally have blocks of blocks of size. Okay, please pay attention. This is something that we had discussed in the first session, uh, not first session, second chapter. Okay, HDFS blocks. Uh, generally, they are of 128 MB, but here we are just considering them as like few bytes, just for demonstration purpose. So. Uh, are you with me, uh, Rajan? Is that your question? Yes, that's correct. So now my question is that it's not even a valid XML anymore because you correct. have cut it in between, correct. right? Correct, yeah. correct. So if you think about it, it's going to be on two different machines, okay? It's going to be on two different machines, one here, other here, okay? This looks really crazy, okay? This is one block, this is another block. Okay. Now, when we load, when the loading process is start, what happens is loading of these things happen parallelly. The loading of this thing happen parallelly. Okay. And this XML loader has been told that, that 
what we are looking for is slash book. We are telling that that our marker is the this is our marker, right? So what will happen is this on on both the machines these this re, this is called text input format. Text input format is going to be started when we when we say uh, our loading process is starting in a Spark. What happens is on every machine it is going to use MapReduce or you can say Hadoop's input format. This is basically called input. Uh, I think I'll just type it instead of writing this way. This is called input format. Okay, so our loading process is going to happen parallelly on all the machine. If if you were just gathering all of it together, loading it in XML, then the purpose of big data has failed. Okay, if you were just collecting it on one machine, loading the entire XML uh, like a DOM model, then the purpose is defeated, right? That's purpose good. of the whole big data is defeated. Now here, here, what's going to happen is input format is going to be launched parallelly on multiple machines. First machine, and the simple thumb rule is going to be that, hey, this is XML input format that's running here. This is called XML input format. This is also called XML input format. So the same class is going to be launched on all the machines. This is going to be in the container, or you can say this is going to be run as a program inside Yarn, right? That's what the, the, the Spark Spark is going to launch this. So parallelly on all the machines holding our blocks of data. So it's going to keep on skipping the data till it notices that there is a slash book encountered. Okay. If this pointer is not starting from the beginning of the file, it will keep on skipping till slash book it has observed. At that point of time, it will start reading. Okay. And this portion this portion which has been skipped, which will be, it will be sent to the previous node, okay? So while the, the previous node is reading the data from this side and creating, the other part has come from other machine and has completed, it has completed loading of its parts, okay? So this is what happens in case of XML input format. So Sandeep, in this case, the problem is also that now you test sequential, right? Because the the two machines there was a block three right so it's not yeah. sequential if you look at it so so I'm, I'm look at this one so while this guy was going from this to this reading it it's skipping it okay and this is going going this portion is going to be to, to be sifted as well as at the same time this is also reading okay by the time it reaches here this has come already from the other side. So it's not going to be sequential. Okay. It's going to be joined here. Okay. No? Uh, I, I get sure. it. But I think uh, what I'm confused is that now if there was a block three and block four. Yes. It only makes sense if I join block two's beginning data with block one's end data. Correct. 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 That three. portion is that portion is uh, sequential. Okay. That portion is okay. sequential. So it, it kind right. of tracks, keeps track of the blocks and uh, okay, got it. Right. So block two's beginning, block two's beginning will be moved to block one. Block three's beginning will be moved to block two, and block four's beginning will be moved to block three, and so on till the end. All right, so there is okay. a, a tiny bit of trans, transfer of the data, tiny bit of transfer, not the entire block. Okay, Okay. this is what happens inside XML input format. Okay. Okay, we so under the, under the hood, the data was raw. HDFS has cut the data ruthlessly into these fixed size blocks. Now at the time of processing, we needed to construct the logical structure. And for doing that, we have, and we have to do logical structure as well as we have to do it parallel without, without overflowing one memory. Because when, we, when I looked at the data for the first time in case of telecom, these XML files were 
going to around 100 gigabytes. And, and you can't load 100 gigabyte on one machine. Therefore, the only possible way was to use the XML input format like this. Okay, so block one, block two were cut by HDFS while the processing is happening by a class called XML input format. All right. Okay. So when you specify the option road tag book, is that right. what it is to join? Correct, correct. So these Good blocks are mm -hmm. Are these blocks are sequential? Blocks are sequential, yes. Otherwise, if we are not, these are not sequential, we won't be able to ever concatenate and form the whole file, right? So they could be on different machines. They, they, so according to the metadata, it will be picked, the block Correct. will be picked. Correct. Sandeep, question. Yes, go ahead. Hit yeah, block two to block one handover, who, who does that? So this is the duty of the framework specifically the XML input format framework, the input format framework. So that's a, like a Java or Scala code? It, it, it's a Java code, yes. Okay. The Java code is being run by say the, say, say Yarn, which is doing the, all the magic. And, and notice that the same thing is also happening in case of plain text files. Because there also, the lines, when we say sc.txt file, right? If the file is really big and is broken down into multiple blocks, there also the same problem happens. There the life is easier because there it is only looking for slash n. So it'll keep on skipping the data as soon as, a, uh, till the point it notices a slash n, okay? So there it is not calling XML input format. It is calling something else. Calling text input format. Okay. All right. So text input format, XML input format, they are the ones which are utilizing a base input format to do the entire magic for it. Okay, so Hadoop provides these input format classes in which you could, if, if you don't like any of these, you can create your own input format and utilize that while handling any of the data. Fantastic. In, in a typical XML, it is allowed to have another book element underneath the book also, right? Will that yeah. confuse these things or uh, yeah. if you're using big data, I'm very, I make sure that it's in the same. Yeah. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's a wonderful question. And that's the first question I also had. So in this case, actually the XML input format fails to handle that because because it's not going to, it's not going to, uh, you know, in that case, if to handle that one, you'll have to load the entire object into the memory. Only then you can figure out that this is the beginning, this is the end, right? Yeah. So okay. th that's exactly where it fails. Similarly, if you take a look at the JSON object, the whole file was not a valid JSON object. Instead, it was looking for new line characters and each each line was a JSON object. All right? Okay. Because in case of JSON, uh, you can't really figure out the curly brackets. There are too many curly brackets. You have no stopping point, and you can't really you, you can't really figure out that from with which point should I consider a record. All right. Okay. So, okay, good point. Very good. Very good questions. All right, I hope I've answered your question, Hitendra. Do you have more questions? Wonderful, so let's move ahead. So this was a good overview for others also who have not gone through say uh, detail, details of HDFS so far. All right, so there we go now. We were here, we were able to successfully load the, the Parkway, Parkway into the data frame and... Sandeep, so Parquet file contains a normal data or a binary form? Binary data. Binary and Avro also? Avro also. Okay, and that bi binary data you are converting to raw data? That's, a, that's actually, the binary data means raw data. 
Then binary data you are converting into meaningful data. Correct, correct. By using these, by using these functions. Yeah. Okay. okay. So those uh, right. Continuing uh, one more point I wanted to add. That's why while handling large number of files or large amount of data, we also use a Hadoop format called sequence file. Okay, sequence file. In case you have many small files, you can convert them into a single sequence file. Sequence file has these markers already. So you don't have to scan when we are loading sequence file, then this transfer does not happen. It can just directly load the data wherever it is found. So that is uh, really easy. So sequence file was designed to overcome this kind of a problem uh, in the in the data. All right, the fragmented kind of problem. Sequence uh, file is used for what kinds of uh, file formats? Let's because say, le yeah, let's say you have, yeah. let's say you have a folder which mm -hmm. contain many files, then you can convert that into a sequence file. Okay. Oh, so it's like merging everything together and then Yeah, it. just like tar file, just like zip file, it's that one. Sequence Excellent. sequence file is sequence file format is an is a is a key value. When you load sequence file, it'll be loaded as key value. It'll be loaded as key and value, key and value. So mm -hmm. it'll be like a big RDD where file name, file name will be the key, and uh, data will be the value. Okay, for each file. But I was just wondering what would be the extension of the files? There is no extension as such. Okay. There is no mandatory uh, requirement of an extension. So Sandeep, there... what kind, yeah, what kind of file Hadoop cannot detect? I think all you many you have covered like XML, Avro, so what kind of the file, it has limitations. So Right. So in case like there, there are many, there, there could be a format that you could create by yourself, right? In those cases, you might have to handle that those file using the using say binary files format. There is a function called sc.binary. Using that you can load the full full folder and process those files yourself by by using your Scala code or Java code. All right. Do you mean uh, user defined files? Yes. And other files it can able to detect or MV file, video files, everything. Not always, not always. There are only the the basic ones that look. Uh, so there are only if let's say you see a format, if you see a format, and so you generally go through, uh, say Sparks uh, various libraries and see whether that particular format is available or not. Okay. So, so it's not Hadoop push. Video file and MP3 files are uh, can be detected. So those you can load as binary files and you will have to use a scalar code to deal with it. But that can be loaded. Yeah, uh, uh, binary file you can load, yes. All kinds of formats. Okay. Okay. All right. Now a question is, uh, now once we have projected our data, then we can go ahead and save the data using write.save. Now what it does is it saves in your home folder. This saves in your home folder. We can take a look at uh, say Hadoop FS, not here, here. You can say Hadoop FS LS and this is the name of the file. This is basically going to create a folder with that name and containing various parts of the data frame. This is the first part and so on. Okay, so using this, also notice that we actually gave the dot .park format, which doesn't make sense because this is a folder name. Okay, all right, so this way we can save the data by default. By default, data frame is saved in park format. Similarly, once we have loaded the data, let's say in JSON format, this is how we load it. We could save this JSON format by into Save Parkway format. This is how we can do the translation. We can do the translation of one format to another. 
So here we loaded the JSON file, uh, JSON file, and then we are say doing something on it. Even if we don't do anything on it, you can still save it directly. Okay, and here it says the file already exists, so we could just change the name. Okay, change the name, and say five, six May. All right, so. So this this is the one that has been created now. You could say Hadoop, FS, LS, and this. So we can convert from one format to another using the data frame, as you can see here. All right. So also, if you are not feeling like creating a data frame by loading the file, you want to just, you know the format here. So you can actually use this kind of mechanism also. So you can create data frame directly from the, the, the underlying file. Okay, you can create the data frame directly from the underlying file using this. Please notice that there's a back code here. Okay, the back code has been put here so that it does not, it, it does not uh, conflict with the double code or anything. All right, so you could also you could also uh, load the data directly using using this kind of a format. All right. Also, you can read the data directly from Hive tables. And since Hive has large number of dependencies earlier the hive table was not enabled but for us it is already set okay so if you are let's say if you're dealing with you want to load the data you, you want to load the data from hive tables hive is nothing but a, a kind of storage on top of hdfs a tabular storage on top of hdfs using which you can process a lot of data and you have to just write the queries and it will read the data from HDFS and uh, process the data in the form of tabular structure. So Spark SQL replaces Hive in many sense. So Spark guys did a very, very clever choice that you can use the tables that you created in Hive while the processing remains in Spark. So the metadata information metadata information like table structure and other things will figure out from Hive while the processing will happen on the Spark side. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So here, here we are, here we are basically, so we have already connected our current Spark with the, with the Hive. Okay, so even though we have not defined a table a underscore or we have not defined a view called a underscore student, it is able to load it. Why? Because by default, if a table is not found in this Spark namespace or review is not found in Spark namespace, it's going to go to Hive and load it because we have enabled the Hive integration with our, with our Spark SQL. So you can see we are able to load this a, dot a underscore student from Hive. If you want to take a look at, say, Hive, okay? So in the Hive, in the Hive, there would be a, the default database. Under the default database, there would be a table called a, a underscore student. All right, so that's uh, pretty much for today. We will continue from Hive tables in the next session. Sandeep, how many classes remains? Two classes? Uh, yes, there'll be uh, maybe one and a half class. That's all. Okay. All right. Uh, Sandeep, I have a request. Yes. Uh, can you talk about NoSQL in the next class? Uh, no SQL. Actually, there is a chapter called No SQL, and probably it is uh, available to you. Is it available? Let me just check. Oh, okay. So in the meantime, you could go over probably 
the NoSQL. Yeah, I think this would be enabled in your in your course. Could you take a look? I think it's not there. All right. Okay. So actually, the NoSQL was part of the previous, the first part of it, Big Data with Hadoop. Mm -hmm. All right. That's why, uh, the, because NoSQL itself will take a lot of time. Okay. All right. So that's All right. Good. Okay. And if okay. I have a quick question. Um, yes. Yes, Rajan. Um, so if I have, if I have uh, hundreds of uh, XML files, the example right. that we had, we had one XML and we mapped it into a uh, data frame. Mm -hmm. But if I have hundreds of XML having this book information, mm -hmm. and I want to actually go across these uh, multiple XMLs and then search for it, mm -hmm. uh, at a high level, can you describe what, how would I go about that? Okay. So let's say you have many XML. Each XML is how big? Um, few, few MBs. Okay. Right. Then you can actually deal with that, that re really simply. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can do is just load the the uh, using sc dot text files. There is a mm -hmm. there is a method called sc dot uh, not text file sc dot whole text file. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So using that, you can load each of the file as a separate object, and then using the XML reader, you can you can convert each of them into an XML object, and then process those. So can I convert everything into a single uh, data frame uh, so that I can actually query on the price of the books in the example that you are handling? Right, uh, right, so right, right. So uh, if you take a look at it, I think this should be possible. This should be possible. Let me just take, you should take a look at the API of Spark SQL. Okay, Spark SQL XML. Or, okay, so there, here, if you take a look, um, you should be able to specify the folder instead of the file. Most okay. of the APIs support giving the folder name, not only the file name. All right. Okay. So I can have all my XMLs in one folder and give work with it, and then it will create a data frame which has got a consolidated I, information across this. Okay. I think so, I think so, but um, give it a try. If you are stuck, okay. let me know. All right? Okay, I will, I will try it out. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks Great. All right, we will continue from here in the next session. Okay, so great. Sandeep. Yeah. Yeah, this is Alok. So I have one question. Like you told earlier, like JSON, we cannot partition in the multiple uh, come again, come again. Yeah. Like, uh, I might be much misunderstood. Like, JSON, if I have a big file and I want to put into the SDFS, so it is not possible to partition into the multiple block or in multiple nodes, the JSON? JSON? Yeah, JSON file. Yes, yes. So, good question. So, here, uh, right, um, let me just go back to the second question here. Uh, I just wanted to show you the errors. We will we'll talk about it later. So if you take a look at, say, here, I'll just bring it back. Bring it. So if you take a look at this one, if this is okay to you, that one is perfectly fine. So here you see, it's not a, it's not a single JSON object. These are multiple JSON objects. Yes. Separated by new lines. Okay. Okay, so this kind of format is very much possible if you have a humongous data, but if you want the whole file to be a single JSON object, that is going to be difficult. Okay, that cannot be partitioned into multiple blocks. Even you, you can partition it, but there is no way to process JSON data that way. Okay, okay. so it means we like if you have the like complete JSON object, so you have to put into a separate, separate line. Correct. correct. So that, that it will work. Like you can read one line and that correct. one line is equal to a JSON object. Correct. So you can transform that. That's right. So it can it can read by the slash and means new line kind of. Yes, yes, yes. So if I put the complete one JSON object in a one file, that cannot right. be possible. The, saving is possible, but loading is very difficult. Yes, yes. Loading then is you, difficult. You cannot you, process it. 
correct correct that's why you will notice that almost everywhere they say json in case of hadoop what they do is they have one single line dedicated for one uh, one uh, json object okay all right thank you so much all right great great set of questions thank you everyone i look forward to see you next week all right i too learned a lot mohammad raju robin hitendra sachin and everyone R rajan and and uh, shavanti great great set of session uh, and i look forward to see you next week bye bye have a good day